Thank you very much, Hugh, for that introduction. And thank you, Pete Buttigieg, the 19th Secretary of Transportation, for being here. Great to see you again, Mr. Secretary. Same here. Great to be with you and uh, really honored to, to be on this stage. As was mentioned, uh, uh, South by Southwest, I think, was a turning point in our campaign. So I uh, can't wait to be back out in person with uh, Mayor Adler and all our friends in Austin, uh, hopefully next year, but uh, honored to be part of this virtual event. So well, let's talk about your journey. Um, as Hugh mentioned in, um, in his introduction, you were the little known mayor of South Bend, Indiana, when I first interviewed you in December 2018. By the time we talked again in May 2019, a CNN town hall had turned you into a, the breakout star of the Democratic presidential field. And when we met again in Charleston, South Carolina, just a year ago, you'd already become the first LGBT candidate for president to win a state. You won Iowa. Um, many people might not realize that or know that given all the glitches with the app. And then less than a week later, you ended your presidential campaign. It was a remarkable rise to watch from my vantage point. What was it like for you? You know, in some ways, I'm still processing the experience because when you're in it, you're in it. And each day brought just a, a whole new level of, of excitement and, and, and momentum. Uh, the, the biggest thing I would say was uh, it was an experience in getting to know an entire country all at once. When you're mayor, uh, you, you certainly feel like uh, uh, you're operating at a high speed and dealing with all kinds of different issues. But then you get put through this process that, that just catapults you across the country. And at the same time, is very intimate because it, it focuses on a handful of states that you get to know so well. And one of the things that uh, uh, whatever reforms come in, in the future of, of nominating processes, uh, one thing that I hope we can always preserve is, is that way that every candidate, whether you're a former vice president or whether you're an obscure mayor, uh, has to humble themselves in, in people's backyards and living rooms and, uh, and diners and, and uh, really make your case and, and really get to know people. And now you're talking to us as the Secretary of Transportation, and you are the first uh, openly LGBTQ plus person to be a cabinet secretary. What does it mean to you um, to break that glass ceiling? Well, it means a lot. I mean, I, I can remember in the 1990s as, as a teenager when there were a lot of news stories about President Clinton proposing to appoint an ambassador, just an ambassador. Uh, who was openly gay. And uh, in the end, he got jammed up in the Senate, couldn't even get a vote, uh, only was able to serve eventually because of a recess appointment. And uh, you know, it was a long way from understanding what that story might mean to me. Uh, at the time, I don't think I had any ambitions of being appointed by a president to anything, but uh, it was a story that I thought about a lot and actually reached out to him. James Hormel is his name uh, after, mm -hmm. uh, uh, after I was named. And, and he let me know that he had actually made a point of asking to be appointed to, or named to something that the Senate would have to vote on, knowing that they would stand in the way. And I think, uh, you know, the history of the LGBTQ community and, and more broadly, the history of inclusion and acceptance is really paved by people like that who make these sacrifices, knowing that they're going to chip away at that wall. So I shared that story a few times around the time that I was named. Um, but my husband, Chaston, reminded me. Uh, he's been, he'd been reading the book, uh, The Deviance War by Eric Cervini, which, which mm -hmm. talks about uh, uh, the, the struggles that went on during the Lavender Scare, uh, as it was known under the Eisenhower administration. Um, just how deep the patterns of exclusion were. We talked a lot about, in my lifetime, uh, you know, being a presidential appointee who's out, or uh, what it took to be able to serve in the military for people in the LGBTQ community. Uh, but just a generation or two ago, I mean, certainly within the memory of some people, watching this program, uh, there were people who, never mind being a soldier or a cabinet officer, couldn't be a bookkeeper or an astronomer in the federal government because you were considered a threat just by virtue of being different. Uh, so it's a reminder of how much has changed. And of course, also, uh, I think, propulsion to see through the further changes that need to happen until it's no big deal. Uh, and recognizing how many other ceilings need to be broken uh, and, and are being broken. Uh, in, in this cabinet. I was just in a, a virtual uh, meeting with, with several uh, members. This is the first time I got to uh, uh, be with uh, Secretary Deb Holland since she was confirmed as the first uh, Native American uh, woman to be serving in the cabinet. It's, it's one of many reasons I'm so excited to be part of this team. 
Uh, let me get your thoughts on something that uh, a mutual friend of ours, Richie Jackson, who's a, a Broadway producer, in a column celebrating your, your appointment to be Secretary of Transportation, he wrote this column in The Advocate where he takes issue with the term, quote, openly gay. And he wrote in The Advocate, openly applauds audaciousness, signaling that an LGBTQ plus person is not the norm. And this particular LGBTQ plus person isn't as shameful as warranted. The term is for straight people, not for us. It is their marker, not ours. And then he says the word out belongs to us. And that's how we should describe ourselves because as he writes, this is a quote, out is hard fought and hard won, the crowning achievement of each of our own specific stories of bravery and resilience. Would love your thoughts on that real fast. I like that. I think, uh, you know, we're in a moment where we're really realizing how vocabulary matters. And uh, it, it's, it's a great point. Again, we want to get to the point where there, there is nothing presumptive about why you wouldn't be out. But we know we're a long way from that. And frankly, within our own community, uh, we, we need to make sure that we are showing regard for people's very different journeys to being out. Uh, because it, it, that is a very different experience for people, depending where you live, where you come from, and what your life is. Mm -hmm. All right, let's talk about the, the substance of your, of your job from the perch, from your perch at the Department of Transportation. Will the American Rescue Plan be beneficial to you and the agency? And if so, how? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. It actually presents a challenge for our agency, too, uh, because there's something on the order of $40 billion that uh, are coming through our, through our pipes, so to speak, that we've got to make sure are spent well. But we've got a fantastic staff and, and so many career employees here who uh, know how to make sure that that happens. One of the reasons that the rescue plan was so important from a transportation perspective is that it contained resources to keep our transit agencies going. Uh, look, our transit agencies got crushed in terms of revenue uh, because of, of, of the fall in ridership. Uh, same thing happened to Amtrak. A lot of folks don't know that Amtrak actually had just achieved uh, operationally being in the black. Uh, they, they were running a positive number on their books, which uh, given the constraints of Amtrak, that's an extraordinary achievement. And it happened just before COVID. Soon they lost more than 90% of their riders. And so the resources in here for Amtrak are also critically important for uh, an organization that was going to have to look at cutting even more routes, uh, uh, dropping employees. Uh, then in the private sector, you got aviation, where thousands of furlough warnings and notices were going out to flight attendants across the country. And uh, one of the times I was really smiling as we uh, saw the news of the rescue plan passing uh, play out was seeing messages from the airline saying, you can tear up those furlough notices, your jobs are safe. And, and that's what the plan was about. It was about getting through this incredibly tough moment. It was about supporting American workers and, and families. And, and let me be very clear, because some folks are saying, well, what does that have to do with COVID? First of all, it's because we wouldn't be here if it weren't for COVID. But secondly, it's that we can't fight COVID unless we have a healthy transportation sector. We can't get people their vaccines if they literally can't get teens are is one of the reasons why supporting transit matters so much, especially for people who are transit dependent and don't have access to a car. All of these things are connected. The design of the American Rescue Plan recognized that, and I'm thrilled that it passed. You know, one of the expectations is now uh, here in Washington is now that the American Rescue Plan uh, is now law and done, that the next big massive legislation that's going to roll through Congress is going to be an infrastructure uh, plan bill of some sort. What would a truly forward-looking infrastructure plan for America look like? Well, it's definitely time. It's, it's past time. And, you know, in the last administration, infrastructure week became a punchline because we kept getting our hopes up for something big to happen on infrastructure, and it never did. I think we're close to the beginning of what I'm going to call infrastructure season. And if we do it right, this is going to be an infrastructure decade because there is so much demonstrated need. In fact, there's a combination of things happening right now, which added up together, I think, are a once-in-a-century opportunity and a once-in-a-century imperative to do big things in infrastructure. Uh, a, a lot of times uh, in the discussion about this, people point to the last big move like this, which was the creation of the interstate highway system under President Eisenhower. You would have to go almost a century before that to see something as big, and that would be President Lincoln seeing through the transcontinental railroad. And if you want to go back even further, you could look at the creation of the Erie Canal, which is important even if you don't care about canals. 
else, but really helped make the various states into one United States of America economically. I think this moment could be on par with those moments to create a vision for what infrastructure needs to look like in this 21st century, that we're already a fifth of the way through. What does it actually mean concretely? Well, let me start with something unglamorous, which is fixing and, and improving what we've already got. There's about a trillion dollar backlog just in the roads and the bridges that we already have. We got to fix them. And I know this is probably heresy in Texas, uh, but I'll add that there are some things that may need to be reduced. Sometimes roads need to be widened. Sometimes roads need to go on a diet. And as mayor, I saw that we had a lot of paved surfaces in our community where every square inch of pavement was something that, that I had to make sure was plowed and repaired and patched up and deal with the water that ran off of it. Uh, in other words, there's a cost of ownership to every square inch of pavement in this country. So we should be adding and subtracting to optimize what we've already got. Next thing we've got to do as part of that vision is get ready for our climate future. Transportation can be part of the solution. In fact, it has to be because uh, transportation is the biggest part of the problem. We're, we're the biggest sector when it comes to greenhouse gas emissions, which means improving transportation is the biggest thing we can do uh, to, to get our economy on the right track. A better transportation vision includes equity, understanding that uh, inequities, especially racial inequities in our country, were often created or worsened either by a lack of investment or by investments that took the destructive shape of a highway destroying, for example, a thriving black neighborhood. This happened over and over and over again. And we've got to make sure that a future policy is actually helping to create equity and not working in the opposite direction. And the other thing I'll mention is competitiveness. So uh, other countries are not hesitating. Uh, in fact, by some estimates, China is investing more on infrastructure than the US and Europe combined right now. That amounts to a strategic advantage. If we don't wanna see that become permanent, then we've gotta fix our roads and bridges. We've gotta upgrade our national airspace. We have gotta have passenger rail worthy of the leading economy in the world. And we've gotta make sure that our vehicles are cleaner, greener, safer, and that people have alternatives to getting into vehicles at all. All right, Mr. Secretary, you said something in your answer a moment ago that caught my attention. And that was, I think you said either roadways have to be put on a diet or pavement has to be put on a diet. Does that mean then reducing the size of, of maybe not highways, but of roadways and reclaiming that for say, either park space, open spaces, or bike lanes, things like that? In some places, yes. Uh, you know, in the 50s, the mentality around roads was that they existed for one purpose, and that was to move as many cars as you could as fast as you could. And design reflected that, and whole cities were shaped based on that assumption. It turns out that we're better off if our decisions revolve not around the car, but around the human being. Now, sometimes that human being's in a car, and we got to make sure that car can get where it needs to efficiently and safely. Sometimes that human being is on foot uh, or on a bicycle. And one thing that I don't think a lot of Americans are aware of is how far behind we are on bicycle and pedestrian safety. Uh, in other words, other developed countries are safer to walk or bike on uh, in than, than American streets typically are. The design choices we make about how fast cars move, whether there's bike lanes and sidewalks sharing the space with, with travel lanes, green space even, all of this is part of that picture. And it's an example of what it means to have a, a truly forward-looking approach on infrastructure. Look, sometimes we do need to add a road or widen one. Just as often, I think we need to subtract. Mm -hmm. let, let me work in a question here from Soren Jensen. And Soren asks, moving towards the goal of a carbon neutral world in 2050, what would be, as seen from the U.S. Department of Transportation, the top three breakthroughs, political, technological, et cetera, needed in transport and infrastructure to address climate change and prevent further damage to the climate? Well, some of the breakthroughs we need are technical, and electric vehicles are a good example. We are gradually approaching the point where an electric vehicle is actually cheaper to buy and own than a gas vehicle. Uh, we're not quite there, depending what class of car you're talking about, but we're close, which is one of the reasons why you see Detroit moving aggressively in this direction. Now, when that happens, that's still not enough for everybody to go electric, uh, if only because of the concern about range anxiety. That's why the president has committed to putting up half a million charging stations around the country. And then we got to work with the Department of Energy to make sure the grid is ready for that. So I'll point to that potential breakthrough of electrification of, of, of cars. 
as part of the solution. Uh, but it has to be accompanied by another breakthrough, which is where we get our energy from. Remember, if your car is electric and your electricity comes from coal, then it's not, not a clean car, even though it's not burning gas in the engine. It's another example of how we got to take the whole system together. Now, as far as a political breakthrough, what I think really needs to happen is for us to be competing across the political spectrum for how to best achieve the goal of making the U.S. carbon neutral by 2050. In other words, I want there to be a vigorous debate between the Republican vision for getting us to net zero by 2050 and the Democratic vision for getting us to net zero by 2050. Now, our Republican friends don't talk about uh, how to do that very often. Uh, but what we want to be arguing over is whose plan to do it is best, rather than whether we should do it at all, because frankly, we're out of time uh, for that argument. We literally can't afford to stay bogged down. In. The last breakthrough that I think is important is a breakthrough in attitude uh, among all of us, the American people, about how we feel and what we think when we're taking up challenges related to climate. Uh, often we think of it in terms of doom, and, and I understand why. The, the, the uh, scenarios are terrifying for what will happen if we don't get a handle on this. What's already happened in this country, from Texas freezing over uh, to wildfires out west, floods in my part of the country, and more. But uh, ultimately, I want us to be thinking about climate uh, not as a source of doom, but as a point of pride. Because I think, frankly, pride is a little more uh, uh, of a propulsive and less of a paralyzing emotion than guilt. Uh, this could be a national project, as is starting to happen with the way that the U.S. auto industry, for example, uh, is meeting the climate challenge with electric vehicles. We need the same thing to be happening in aviation, in, in shipping, uh, in, in the way we design cities so you can get around without having to get into a car in the first place increasingly. All of that should be part of a national project that makes us proud, uh, that, that makes us lead, authentically lead the world. And I'll tell you, some of these conversations that I'm in that are led uh, at the White House uh, by Gina McCarthy, who's coordinating our domestic policy on this, uh, or Secretary John Kerry, who's taking the lead on our uh, international work. It's all supportive of the president's vision to do exactly that. Uh, so we've got the right leadership to make it happen. But again, this has to be a national change in mentality for all of us to make this our project. I'm going to burrow in on, I think it was point two in the political point. And yes, it has to be a vigorous conversation between Democrats and Republicans to address the needs or certainly the question Soren's question about being carbon neutral and the America's role in that. But how can you as Secretary of Transportation, if not talk to Republican members on the Hill to try to have a substantive conversation about climate? Is there anything you can do to talk to their constituents about how important these goals are and why they need to have their members of Congress support what you're trying to do overall? Yes. And uh, let me begin, especially for the audience we have here, by noting that the business community is uh, perhaps further along than a lot of uh, congressional Republicans are when it comes to climate. Uh, this is the time for us to break the old idea of climate versus jobs and instead recognize the new reality of job creation and climate action going hand in hand. Business sees this uh, because uh, it, it's a, a world that is animated by data, and you can no longer ignore the, the cold, hard reality uh, of, of climate change. Uh, so I think that, that continuing to elevate those voices who want America to be more competitive uh, is going to be one way to get the attention of otherwise reluctant members. Going directly to constituents is important, too, because I think most Americans already get it, even if you live uh, in red states especially if you live in red states, when you consider how vulnerable rural communities, anybody involved in farming, for example, can be to climate change. Uh, again, this is not just a coastal concern. I mean, my Indiana hometown has had two once in a millennium floods just uh, in my second term as mayor alone. Uh, this is happening more and more often. So on the harm side and on the opportunity side, I think we can be having conversations that are not red state, uh, blue state conversations, but are American community conversations about how we can win by doing the right thing on climate and letting those folks know who maybe have been told, especially in coal communities or uh, industrial areas like where I come from, you know, workers who feel like they've been told they're part of the problem, uh, making sure that we are enlisting them to be part of the solution because we can't get this done without, without them. We can't get this done without everybody. 
You know, Stephen Clank wants you to di dive in a little deeper on high-speed rail, and he asks, do you see high-speed rail fitting into the transportation mix going forward? And I will add to that, how? So I do, and, uh, and I can't make it happen alone. So for those who are excited about this, uh, this is a great moment for everybody to be speaking up. The way I think about it is pretty simple. Uh, I think that a U.S. citizen ought to enjoy the highest standard of passenger rail service. And there's no reason why what's available to, you, to a U.S. citizen, say in Texas, ought to be inferior uh, to the passenger rail options that are available to uh, a Japanese or British or Turkish or Italian or, or Chinese citizen. And obviously that's not the reality. So we've got to fix it. One of many reasons we've got to fix it is that it's also a much better from a climate perspective. But let's think about the economic options. If we could connect this, the major uh, populated areas of Texas to each other or of the Midwest, where I come from, to each other with quality passenger rail and have that supplementing what's available with cars and what's available with, with uh, aviation and air travel, we would be a more economically connected, more productive country. Uh, to me, it's a no-brainer. Now, it comes with an investment. It comes at a cost. Let's acknowledge that. But you know what? So does driving. We, we invest enormous amounts of public funds in roads and uh, in uh, an energy industry that, that's part of making that all possible. Uh, so uh, let's be real that this has to be a national choice. Now, interestingly, in the US, there is a highway trust fund, dedicated predictable dollars for uh, uh, supporting our roads. There's a trust fund uh, that helps us uh, keep our, our aviation sector going. There's nothing like that on the rail side. And as long as our passenger rail systems have to live hand to mouth uh, from federal support, uh, we're, we're going to be behind. So I think this is a great moment with a president who is famously uh, uh, fond of and, and understands uh, the, the economic potential of passenger rail, uh, me as an enthusiast in this role, and an American public that I think is increasingly excited or at least curious about this. Uh, I think we got a great moment to do it. Uh, the last thing I'll mention is, if it wasn't obvious from what I just said, is again, this is not just a coastal or a blue state thing. You know, the Northeast Corridor is huge. It's obviously where most of our uh, volume and speed of passenger rail travel is right now. We've got to shore that up. Um, but uh, this should be a nationwide priority. Let's talk a little bit more about this. And I'm glad you mentioned Italy because Italy's high-speed trains are incredible. And it's the last place I think a lot of people would think of as having high-speed rail. But when, when I go to Italy and jump on the train and I'm in places in no time, I think back to all the times I've ridden on you know, the Acela going back and forth to New York and how long that takes and how that's supposed to be our version of, of high-speed rail. Um, how do you convince folks um, in the middle of the country who think that rail rail uh, service and rail traffic is just a coastal thing, the benefits of having high-speed rail. And I think you mentioned, you know, imagine connecting Texas cities with high-speed rail. Convince the folks who are watching in Texas or um, in other so-called red states, convince them that, you know what, being able to get from point A to point B in half the time or less than half the time it would take to drive is actually beneficial to you. Well, just think about it. You don't have to be doing the driving and you don't have to be uh, going through some of the steps that we have to to get between these communities. Let me mention something else that I think is convincing, whether you're expecting to be a passenger or not. Jobs. The number of jobs that can be created, uh, both construction jobs in the short term uh, and long term jobs that are created through this economic growth are enormous. This benefits and lifts up entire communities. And, and again, uh, th th this is not a risky or mysterious proposition. The human species has done really, really excellent passenger rail in the places that have been willing to do it. Uh, but uh, you know, not since the days of Lincoln have we been at the uh, precipice of an opportunity like we are now. Uh, Lincoln was right to see how important rail was uh, to this country. And I think President Biden is too. Um, Sherry Greenberg uh, has a question about equ equ equity. Um, she asks, can you describe how you will address equitable access to transportation for resource communities that have suffered from systemic racism. So this, this is hugely important, and it's one of our core priorities in this department. Let me mention a couple of examples of how this has been at stake. 
Uh, one is uh, that especially during that, that period in, in the 50s when a lot of highway construction went on, often the path of least resistance was a black or, or brown neighborhood that didn't have the political power to resist. But it was more than that. It, it wasn't just incidental that often highways tore up uh, minoritized groups, neighborhoods, and communities. Sometimes that was by design. Sometimes a, a highway was considered a way to solve two problems at once and clear out a neighborhood that was considered undesirable. There are all kinds of things that are physically built into our transportation system uh, that exclude. Uh, under Robert Moses, overpasses were designed intentionally too short for buses to pass under uh, so that uh, uh, black and, and Puerto Rican kids couldn't get to beaches uh, that were uh, uh, intended, at least unofficially, to be reserved for uh, white New Yorkers. These are things that, that are physically in our system everywhere. And unlike a lot of other patterns of exclusion, when they are literally in the concrete, they're very hard to reverse. Even if you find that there was a civil rights violation, if it only comes along after something was built, not much that you can do about it. It's one of the reasons why we're reinvigorating the Office of Civil Rights here at the Department of Transportation, which, as you might imagine, did not get a lot of resources or attention during the Trump administration, we are re-energizing that and the fantastic people who work there, not only to try to respond to the complaints that emerge under Title VI of civil rights law, uh, but to help get ahead of some of these things while projects are still being designed and built so that a, a bad project can be reshaped and so that good projects get to, to neighborhoods that, that are what are called transit deserts. We know a lot about food deserts, a, a neighborhood, uh, uh, typically communities of color, where there's not any good access to quality, healthy food. Same thing is true for transportation. And a transit desert is really an opportunity desert because you can't get to a job. And so many people, we saw this certainly in South Bend, uh, were caught in a bit of a poverty trap where you didn't have a high wage enough job to be able to purchase a car. You needed a car in order to lock down a better job. And you wound up uh, relying on uh, maybe an unreliable cousin with an unreliable car. And when mm -hmm. the unreliable transmission gave out, you might lost your, lose your job, or at the very least, lose some hours. Uh, we, we can't allow people to be on the brink like that. And it's part of why we need to have equity on our minds as we're making what could be one of the biggest investments we've ever made as a country in the future of our transportation. Last thing I want to mention here, although we could take a whole hour on this, uh, we've got to make sure we're building up a business this kind of labor base that reflects the communities where these projects are happening. And it's going to be difficult. Uh, it's going to be difficult because there are so many structural and systemic things that have kept things the way they are. And good intentions won't be enough. Uh, but we need to be working now proactively to find ways to build up businesses uh, owned by those who are from the communities that have been excluded. Uh, whenever we're, we're, we're seeing a project out there uh, that is funded with federal dollars, we want to make sure the workers getting those good jobs look like America. You know, can you talk about how the Department of Transportation uses data in its decision making process and what kinds of data and what part of the process is that data used to drive these decisions? So I'm like a kid in a candy store in this department because it's <laughs> full of fellow nerds uh, who have access to and custody of incredible amounts of data which can help us solve a lot of questions uh, and, and help us make better decisions. Uh, to be honest, I'm still getting my arms around some of the resources and assets that we have in this department. Uh, what I can tell you is that uh, data is going to be increasingly vital to making good decisions about transportation. We have ways of computing the data that weren't available before. It's especially important from a safety perspective. Remember, all the other things I talk about, climate equity, job creation, rest on a foundation of why this department actually exists, which is to keep our travel safe. And we now have more data than ever on what works and what doesn't. What kind of highway designs lead to fewer crashes? Uh, what kind of speeds are compatible in different contexts, urban and rural, uh, with fewer uh, uh, fatalities and, and fewer injuries? What kind of designs do we need to promote? Uh, what should we create rules about? And what should we just incentivize or encourage? All of these answers, I think, lie at least partly in the data that are out there. And also, circling back to equity, we need to do a better job of uh, counting up who wins and who loses when a transportation decision is made. Uh, because that can, uh, often those are factual questions that could be answered, uh, but we never stop to collect the information to tell us. I'm going to ask you um, a, a 
couple of perhaps might be seen as controversial questions that have popped into my head listening to your answers, particularly when it comes to the big projects ahead and the big ideas ahead. And you're gonna have to pay for these uh, somehow. Now here in Washington, no one cares about deficits anymore and literal blank checks are being written or at least in the last administration for everything. But I was wondering, um, where are you in terms of, or the administration, in terms of the gas tax? Um, because that's how th that, that fund you were talking about, at least in the past, and correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Mr. Secretary, how the highway fund was funded is through the, through the gas tax. Should that gas tax be raised? So you're right. The Highway Trust Fund was funded almost entire, well, originally in its entirety by a, a tax on gasoline. It's not anymore because the gas tax isn't adding up to enough. The last time it was adjusted was 1993, and it wasn't set up to rise with inflation. Now, uh, while it's, it's true that an adjustment to the gas tax would bring in more revenue, the truth is that would at best be a medium-term solution because we're using less gas. And uh, if we solve the the challenges we need to in terms of electrification, before long, we'll be using no gas at all. Uh, so it's one of the reasons why I, I think there's less excitement about this as anything but a, a medium term or stopgap solution than there would have been if, if we were having this conversation a decade ago. Uh, what we do know is we do, in fact, have to pay for these things. I just hope the question, how do you pay for this, is the beginning and not the end of the conversation. Sometimes mm -hmm. people use that as a way to stop us in our tracks when we're talking about great ideas. But look, this is not a cosmically impossible question. There are three ways you can pay for this. Uh, some kind of fee, uh, user fee, like a gas tax, uh, uh, more general uh, uh, taxes that are collected, or borrowing against future fees and taxes. Those are pretty much your options. There are some public-private partnerships out there. Sometimes you can mobilize private capital to be part of the solution. But for the bulk of it, that's how it's going to have to happen. And what we've got to decide is what political will we have to assemble one or more of those tools to do the job. And one thing that I've found, and I think a lot of mayors and governors have found, is that even people who are very hostile in general uh, to the idea of taxes, and look, nobody likes taxes, um, but even in conservative communities, people will support an increase in revenue if they know what it's going for. And when we know exactly what we need to do, uh, especially when it comes to just fixing what we have, uh, filling in the potholes, fixing the bridges that uh, can be dangerous, not just inconvenient, and costly, not just unpleasant because of the, the damage and the delays that happen. Uh, it, it's very clear that it is worth these investments, whether we're talking about uh, uh, raising revenue or, frankly, whether we're talking about uh, looking to bonding and borrowing. Because the, as a general rule in, in business, you borrow when you think you're going to get a better return, uh, and, uh, and that's what makes it prudent to do it. But one of the best returns you can get on any kind of investment is uh, infrastructure because of the, the economic power that it unlocks. So obviously this is an ongoing conversation. Uh, I'm talking a lot with Republican and Democratic uh, uh, lawmakers on the Hill about what combination of tools we can use to fund this. Uh, it, it's gotta at least partially be paid for. Uh, but I also think there's a case for recognizing that these are long-term investments uh, that, that deserve to be made, uh, whether there's an immediate revenue source in some cases or not. I'm going to save the other controversial question for once you've been in the job a year. <laughs> I'll, save, I'll save that for then. Here's a question from uh, Kristen Anderson. And she's, uh, she asks, if you remember visiting the town hall in Oslo on a tour with then uh, Transportation Secretary Anthony Fox, um, together with Mayor Stephen Adler of Austin, learning about innovative ways to meet the transportation challenges of the future, and now that you are the Secretary of Transportation yourself, will this international cooperation resume? She also asks or says, if you want, um, you can say something in Norwegian. <laughs> uh, well, I, I won't inflict my Norwegian pronunciation on anybody now, but uh, that was a formative trip for me. Uh, first of all, because it was when I first got to know Mayor Adler and, uh, and his wife, Diane, well. Uh, and, and that became a wonderful friendship. It was also a trip where I got to know Maurice Henderson, who was uh, uh, in uh, the city of Portland and is now a senior advisor here at the department, uh, who uh, I recruited ha having gotten to know him there. And it was where I saw in Secretary Fox's leadership uh, what it looked like to have an approach to this Department of Transportation that was not just about repeating what we'd always done, 
uh, but putting things like equity in the spotlight and recognizing that uh, a secretary of transportation ought to be thinking about uh, walking and biking just as much as, as uh, we think about uh, uh, trains, planes, and automobiles. And uh, one of the things we saw traveling to, and I was a mayor as part of this delegation, uh, we were traveling to the cities that had some of the best records in the world on bicycle safety and making it easier to get around on two wheels. Uh, in fact, Oslo and uh, Copenhagen and Amsterdam, uh, which we all visited, have a bit of a competition over who's, who's best at this. And, you know, it's easy, I think, for us Americans to say, well, okay, they're Europe, that's Northern Europe, Scandinavia. Everybody knows they're, they're different. They're, they're all about this stuff. Um, but the thing is, they explained to us how in the 70s or 60s, you would have seen them just as car-oriented and dependent as we are. And they explained the policy choices that made it easier to get around by car and by bike in the cities of, of uh, these countries. And it's really remarkable what can happen if you're intentional about it, especially from a safety perspective. Another thing we learned as part of that trip uh, is not to over-design. Uh, we saw uh, an area in Amsterdam, which is as multimodal as it gets. You have a ferry that arrives on a kind of street area uh, close to where there's, uh, there's, there's light rail, near a train station, full of pedestrians with people getting off on bikes and cars going through. And they tried every which way to regulate and organize all of the different kinds of traffic competing with each other. And in the end, found that less was more. Actually, the, the fewer lines you painted on the street and the, the, the fewer curbs you tried to create, the more people just put their head up, paid attention to each other, stayed out of each other's way, and it actually wound up safer. So you can learn a lot, and we shouldn't be too proud as a country to learn from what's going on in other countries and cities when it comes to making good choices about transportation. And, uh, uh, and yes, I, I want international uh, uh, engagement to be a big part of the job. It already is. Uh, we had a bilateral uh, conversation with the Canadians led by President Biden and, and uh, uh, Prime Minister Trudeau, and I was there with my counterpart. I've spoken to uh, more uh, foreign ministers of transportation than, than I can count and, and a whole lot of ambassadors here in D.C., who are excited to uh, cooperate and collaborate, uh, especially on the climate issue, which is one of those things that no country can do alone. We've got to be coordinating together. But also we're talking about things like uh, the safe return to international travel after COVID uh, and uh, some of the technology issues that, that are emerging that, that are confronting all of our countries. This is a moment, this is a good example of how the return to a U.S. presence, a U.S. leadership, uh, that, that President Biden has been talking about from the earliest days of his campaign. This is part of what that looks like. It's, it's not just in, in uh, uh, the, the uh, you know, most uh, glamorous moments of, uh, of uh, state diplomacy or uh, issues of defense that grab the headlines. It's cooperation around things like transportation, and that'll absolutely be part uh, of what we do here, especially when it does become possible to hit the road. Now, you were confirmed to your position as Secretary of Transportation on February 3rd, if memory serves. So you've only been in the position for a month and maybe a, a week and a half. What I'm wondering is, now that you're brand new in the job, so how are you defining success for your tenure at the department? Well, when I leave this job, when, whenever that is, I want to be able to look back and say that my presence here helped to make the 2020s a turning point in the story of American transportation, it helped to make transportation a source of opportunity and an equitable source of opportunity, uh, and that transportation came to be known as the forefront of the solutions to climate change in our country. I really think we can do that, and uh, I think we have the, the right combination of circumstances to make it happen. Uh, so I'm challenging our team to deliver on those goals. Uh, and, and of course, uh, the other thing that defines a successful tenure here in this department is all the things that don't happen, the crashes that don't happen, the fatalities that don't happen, the disruptions that don't happen, because we maintain the safest possible transportation system. If I were a genie and I could grant you one big transportation, transportation wish, wish what's the one thing you would really like to have happen? in the realm of transportation um, that would make things better for, for the country? Is it a high-speed rail line from Los Angeles to New York? Is it um, the entire nation, um, people driving around only in electric vehicles? Pie in the sky, what would be the, the number one thing you would love to be able to do? 
Uh, you're tempting me to wish for more wishes because it's hard to pick just one. <laughs> um, but what I'd I'll say give you this is a big wish. All right. What would be ideal is for every way of getting around to have the same emissions as riding a bicycle, which is to say none at all. Uh, now, we, we increasingly see how to do it with a car. Uh, we increasingly see how to do it with trains uh, and, and buses, increasingly heavy-duty vehicles too. Uh, aviation's tougher, tougher to figure out how to do it. There's what's called sustainable aviation fuels, which is changing the answer there. A lot of interesting things happening with, with fuel cells and propulsion, but we're, we're a long way off from that. So I might use the magic wand on that, get an airplane to have the same emissions as a bicycle. Uh, oh, I, I wish I had that, one, <laughs> that magic <laughs> wand for you. Uh, here's a question from, in the, the time that we have left, here's a question from Michael Myers. Uh, and this has to do with public service. Uh, and, and I'm paraphrasing here. How can a dynamic young leader like you inspire the next generation to answer the call of public service at the Department of Transportation uh, and across the government? Well, that's a really great question. It's on my mind a lot. Uh, we need to call a generation of Americans to be part of the solution. And uh, I will tell you from, from my time in this building already, the quality and the purpose uh, that just animates the, the people who work in, in this department is extraordinary. Uh, but we need more coming up the ranks. We took a look at our own makeup as a department and uh, found, first of all, that uh, while uh, it's, again, a phenomenal uh, uh, workforce here, it doesn't resemble the country. Uh, it is whiter and much more male than the country as a whole. We've got to change that. The other thing I found out is that uh, in our staff, uh, among the people who work in this department on IT, 1% are under the age of 30. 1% of our IT staff are under the age of 30. So we're going to have some issues as people retire if we aren't recruiting a new generation uh, to be bringing those perspectives and to be signing up uh, for uh, the opportunities of public service. And I think some people get scared off by the idea of career federal employment, uh, the idea that unless you're ready to do that and, and do it for 20 or 30 years, you know, belonging to a generation that, that kind of expects to change careers every few years, it doesn't uh, uh, match how people see themselves. So we got to make sure we're creating, we're doing our part, creating more flexible ways to have a successful career or maybe come in and out of government, not just at the political level, um, but at the career level too. But also tell you this, it is incredibly rewarding. Uh, I mean, we're literally shaping how people and goods are going to move around the country and move around the world uh, at a moment where there's more change happening in that area, from electric vehicles, to automation, uh, to the, the uh, things we're about to, to seek to do around climate and justice. It's never mattered more, or at least it's rarely mattered, to be willing to bring your talents to public service. And I'll say, you know, the kind of people who are tuning in to a South by Southwest talk are the kind of people who I hope are considering how you could be part of the solution. I want to see the kinds of people who went to NASA in the 60s or Silicon Valley in the 90s to be coming into public service in the 2020s because the American project is on the line and we need great people in every corner of this federal enterprise. And I hear you on that, but I'm sure there's someone who's also listening and thinking, that sounds great, but I'm afraid to go into public service because of what happens to people who go into public service, the, the public scrutiny, um, the way social media is at that level. Um, how do you convince that person for whom public service is something they would love to do, but the personal sacrifice they might feel that they would have to endure is just a bridge too far? Well, especially at the high profile and political level, but, but even a, a few layers in, I guess one way I'd answer that question is um, if you're not willing to do it for those reasons and people like you aren't willing to do it for those reasons, spend a moment trying to visualize the person who is and ask whether you want that person to have power over your life and your livelihood. If the answer is no, then you need to consider being part of the solution. <laughs> uh, look, if we chase all the good people out of public service, uh, then we're going to deserve what we get. And it's not going to be pretty. And I think we've seen far too many examples that are not hypothetical uh, of people who thrive on the very worst of social media, uh, winding up in positions of life or death power over the rest of us. 
Uh, and we've got to reverse that. We've got to shift that. I'm not saying it's easy. Uh, I'm not saying it's, it's an easy path, but uh, you, you can't just take that sitting down. Uh, ultimately, it's going to be up to the people who, who choose to be uh, in, in these public roles to decide what the character of this country is going to look like. Uh, otherwise, you're just a passenger. And uh, I don't think this is a time to accept the way things are going. When you were running for president, um, obviously, and as you said, you traveled all around the country, um, talking to all sorts of people in every corner of this country. Through that exercise, did it make you more optimistic or a little more pessimistic about who we are as a nation and what our future, what our future is? It made me not optimistic in the sense that you could look somebody in the eye and talk to them about what you cared about and what they cared about, and you could reach a common understanding. I'm convinced that if we could just all do that and each do that, uh, we'd be in a much better place as a country. But of course, it doesn't work that way. Look, there are a lot of folks uh, in this country who are sucked into some pretty twisted worldviews uh, where we can judge them uh, or we can acknowledge that if we were fed the same diet of misinformation that they were, we might be among their ranks. And I think some humility is in order to recognize that uh, people aren't even living in the same realities. Uh, and again, that, that's not an excuse to accept uh, what's going on. Uh, it, it's uh, a call to recognize that, that we got to find the humanity in other people and, and, and call people to our highest shared values. And we got to establish a more fact-based conversation all around. Not always by wagging our finger at people, telling them they don't have the facts, but uh, by creating, literally creating shared spaces. And I mean literally creating shared spaces. This is part of what transportation and good city design can do. If you physically encounter people who are different from you, you are more likely to be accepting and understanding of where they're coming from. And we, we just have that less and less. Um, I fear that's one of the legacies of COVID, uh, is, is that we're that much more physically isolated. The public square is a literal physical thing uh, from a, a small community to our, the, the beating heart of our thriving cities. And I view part of our responsibility in transportation to expand that public square. What you just said there, as often when, when, we, when we talk, you, you go very deep. And I'm wondering in, the, in this shared space, particularly in, in transportation, it's, so we all get together and I was taken by your saying, not wagging our finger at, at other people, but how do you think you can have a conversation with someone for whom the truth just isn't attainable? Is that even possible? You know, the, best answer I, I mean, the best answer I can think of is to make it attainable to put people in touch with not just our reality, but theirs. I know tons of people who have, or at least I, you hear it from tons of people, who have wild and, and disturbing and wrong views about, uh, for example, widespread voter fraud. Um, but if you ask those people whether they've ever seen that happen in their own precinct, the answer is usually no. Uh, you hear people saying some strange and, and dangerous, uh, dangerously uh, non-factual things about COVID, the pandemic, how to fight it. Uh, but if you ask them about their lived experience or anybody they knew who struggled with it, you have a little bit of reality available. It's one of the reasons why I thought the president was, was wise to point to the fact that uh, while it might be helpful for uh, uh, you know, uh, conservative political leaders to talk about why you need vaccines, uh, what's probably making more of a difference is for people to hear from a doctor or, uh, or, or a pastor that they know in their own community. Uh, look, we know that our gra grasp on that shared reality is getting more and more tenuous as it goes, um, but there's still a ton that we can do. And if somebody really is irreversibly committed to a reality that, that doesn't make room for others, or uh, uh, frankly, isn't in fact a reality, um, then in, in the end, your, your, your only choice is to make sure that uh, uh, you outvote them. And uh, uh, in a democracy, that's, uh, that's how our system is supposed to work. Because if uh, a majority comes to be out of touch with reality, well, then it's too late anyway. So, Mr. Secretary, we've got a little more than three minutes left. And I want to give you the time to answer this last question. Uh, and it comes from Steve Fleming. Um, and it's one that I think is tailor-made to end this conversation, but also tailor-made for you and the way you think. 
and the way you speak. And this question from Steve Fleming is, how important is empathy in today's modern world? It's everything. I mean, uh, uh, look at everything good in terms of what is social, politics, community, anything that involves multiple people. Anything good comes of our ability to identify with the interests of others, to see another human being and what matters to them uh, and their well-being is, is important in some way that's connected to our own. Everything bad and evil, uh, to, to be a little simplistic, but I think true uh, in society, in social context, community, and politics, is when a person looks at another person and doesn't see a person. Uh, and the difference between those two things ultimately is empathy. And it's a good thing to think of, again, maybe especially in a venue like this, uh, uh, to, to remember how empathy is aroused, which is usually not by data, often not by proving that you're right and somebody else was wrong. Uh, it's usually aroused through stories, uh, through finding ways to see one another, through creating shared experience. Uh, and certainly in my own uh, life, that, that's how I've seen empathy built. And even in something that seems as technical or as technological as transportation, I think we'll make better decisions if it's animated by empathy. As a matter of fact, we were having that conversation uh, just a few days ago with staff here in the department as we were deciding uh, a process of defining some of the values that are going to guide us uh, during, uh, during my time here at the DOT. Uh, look, everybody moving has a story of why they're moving. If you're moving in a subway car to get to work, there's a day-to-day -day story. And if we can make that experience uh, a better one, a more whole one, uh, even in the smallest way, that makes somebody's life better in, in the way that their journey to work or to school is repeated thousands of times over across their lives. And when somebody's traveling a long distance, somebody's getting on a plane who maybe doesn't get on a plane off, probably about something that is uh, emotionally very important in their lives, a huge job opportunity, a chance to see somebody they haven't seen in a long time, maybe grief and the loss of a loved one. Uh, these are the things that make us move. They're why we need transportation and can't live fully fulfilled lives uh, without shared resources to get us from point A to point B across the town or across the world. Uh, and if we can come at our choices uh, in transportation and policy, all the way down to the most technical seeming thing, with that kind of empathy guiding us, I think that our policies will be a lot better. And with that, we're going to have to leave it there. Pete Buttigieg, the 19th Secretary of Transportation, thank you very much for being here and thank you very much for coming back to South by Southwest. Thanks for having me. Great to be with you.